so I guess the final thing to do is introduce Joseph Abrahamson. Uh, he comes to us from Reify Health. Uh, he has a background in mathematics and is interested in how mathematics and computer science can in, uh, engage with uh, medical uh, research. And so with that, I will say I'm extremely excited about this presentation because it has a philosophical bent. Uh, which, to be quite frank, is one of the first kind of more philosophical conversations that any of the papers we love have had. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's give a big warm welcome to Joe. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Bob, for a wonderful introduction. Um, so, as Ashley said, I'm trying to talk about a paper which has a connection between mathematics and computer programming and philosophy. And a really quick uh, show of hands, who actually read every single word of that 50-page monstrosity? Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I hoped. Um, I apologize right now. It was a really long, really difficult paper, and you probably didn't expect the first six paragraphs to talk about why Greek words were really important for computer science. But I promise that it's actually a really cool, really influential paper that touches like some of the newest, most exciting parts of type theory, which is pushing static typing and comprehension of what programs mean to like the next level. And I hope in my talk to maybe give a couple of glimpses of that and also to kind of give a historical context, I hope, to understand a little bit better about why what this paper was doing was really exciting and maybe give some uh, directions where you can go if you're interested, if I can get you even slightly interested in some of these things to follow up and learn a little bit more. And so, with all of that scary disclaimer out of the way, let's start with something really uh, natural for programming. Let's do some pair programming in a language I invented. And because this is academic, I'm not going to do it in uh, regular stuff. We're going to do it in LaTeX. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to talk about trees. I hope everyone's really familiar with binary trees. They're reasonably simple. Um, and what I want everyone to pay attention to as I describe this stuff is what I wrote down at the bottom down here. What I'm going to talk about is like, I'm going to say this in a really particular way, and hopefully it's really familiar seeming, but there's some deeper meaning to the way I'm saying it. So, I want to work with trees. The type of trees is tree, unsurprising. It's parameterized by the things that you would store in the tree. So this notation says that trees take some other type, A, and they store those things inside the tree. So if you've got a binary tree like we will have, you'll have at each node and each leaf an, an A, whatever A is unknown at this point. And what I've done right here is I've declared the type of trees. The type of trees requires me to say tree, and what am I sticking in the tree? So that's a type two. So hopefully this is starting to make a little bit of sense. I put the colon, and I put some description of what the thing to the left of the colon is. So tree of A's is a type. By the way, before I go any further, please ask questions. Like, if you have any questions at all, no matter how stupid, I, I love questions, please ask questions. Um, all right, cool. So, I've declared a type right here. How do I give that meaning? How do I give that weight and force? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how can I create values of that type. So, this syntax means I'm going to be talking about how we construct trees. We construct trees by building leaves, which hopefully is pretty familiar. This syntax might be weird, but I'm just talking about we can construct trees with this leaf word. And leaf takes an A, whatever A was, and turns it into a tree. So I'm saying if I want to make a leaf of a tree, I take some A value and I wrap it up with this leaf word, and now it's a tree containing just that one A at the leaf. The other way I can build trees is I can build, oh, that should say node, not successor which is a little bit of a foreshadowing. I can build a node which takes a tree, an A, and another tree, and turns it into type tree. Now, it wouldn't be live coding if I didn't make a bunch of mistakes, so let me point out some really quick mistakes. Trees should say A at the end of them to, again, indicate that they contain A's. That happens throughout the whole thing. And successor should be node. So hopefully, if you, if you can follow this notation, again, if you have any questions, please ask. What I've defined here is a way of building values of this type that I declared as tree. I can stick an A into a leaf and get a really simple tree that just has an A. If I take two leaves, I can stick them together with another A using this node constructor. And then I get a, a bigger tree with three A's inside of it. 
And I can keep doing that over and over and over again and build any kind of finite large tree that I want. And so what I'd like to convince you is that what I've given you with these constructors here is a way of envisioning and understanding and comprehending all of the values inside of this type tree. And the really important thing is I've just defined that type. I've told you most of what you need to know to understand the meaning of trees. They are leaps and they are nodes and they are these finite things, binary trees. Hopefully that's all familiar to everyone. So I want to stop right now and gather some questions because it's going to ramp up a little bit from here. This all makes sense so far? Gravy. Um, hey, I had a slide for that. <laughs> all right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is this scary thing called piano arithmetic, which just means positive numbers. Um, again, I'm writing in LaTeX, so I write positive numbers with this boldface n, meaning natural, but it just means positive numbers. I want to talk about the type of naturals. And the type of naturals, again, the way I discover what the meaning of this type is, is I say, how do I construct, or introduce in this case, introduce is a technical term, you'll perhaps see it later, introduce naturals. So if you're familiar with piano arithmetic, which is a very foundational mathematical kind of thing, but is useful for programming sometimes too. We have zero, and to introduce zero, I just say zero. It's a natural number. It's zero, which you probably expect to be the natural number zero. Um, and I can talk about successors, which is where the previous slides came from. Successors of natural numbers. And so this is saying successor takes some natural number, be it zero or five or whatever, and makes it one more than that. So if I write successor of zero, that means one. If I write successor of successor of zero, that means two. And so again, I've given you something really fundamental about what naturals are when I've written this stuff down. And what I want to kind of suggest is that you are understanding almost everything that you need to know about naturals by the structure of how I've written these things. So. That was all mystical sounding. Again, these are fairly simple. Anyone have questions about the natural numbers? All right, cool. Because I'm about to get crazy. Another thing that we'd really like to do with natural numbers is recurse on them. Um, again, if you've got a mathematical bent, you're probably familiar with the idea of recursion and induction as being this thing that somebody in like some discrete math class taught you was really important and how you had to do it with these really precise steps. I'm going to assert that if I want to talk about the type of naturals, I also have to talk about induction and how that works, or recursion, as we're going to call it here, rec underscore n. Um, so what is this thing? This thing's going to be a lot more complicated. It's a thing that has a type again. The colon is saying that the stuff to the right of it is going to describe what rec of n is in some sense. Um, so this is going to get funny. What we want to recurse over is some kind of result of the naturals. It could be I'm going to add two naturals together, and so the result will be another natural number. It will be another, like the addition of the two things. But I'm calling it this really ambiguous thing called a property of the naturals. And what I actually mean by that is it's going to take some natural number and produce a type. This should cause like warning bells to go off, or maybe it won't, but like there, that is, if that's confusing, good. That's a confusing thing to see the first time you see it. But I'll talk about later. One thing P could be is evenness. If 3 is an even number, the property of 3 being even would be P. There's something wrong with the property of 3 being even, we should all hopefully appreciate. But um, it's sensible for me at least to consider the idea of 3 being even. Um, so P is a property like that. We're going to give the induction step, which again, if you're familiar with induction, will sound like the induction step. If you're familiar with something more like, like um, right folds on lists, like if you're a Haskell programmer folder, if you're a closure programmer, then reduce or transducers, all the stuff they're doing now. Um, uh, it's called collect in Ruby. It's called um, lots of different things, but just folds on lists. This will look kind of familiar, actually. If you ignore a lot of this stuff. We've got a natural number, some property of natural numbers, and we take it to some other property of natural numbers. What we want to do is we want to combine a natural number with a property that we already have in order to deduce, introduce a new property. And I very carefully index these things, hopefully very carefully, so that we can kind of see that the, actually, 
you guys have a laser pointer by any chance? I'll keep going, but a laser pointer would be nice. Thanks. Um, if you look at this really carefully, and this is maybe a little bit strange, the input property right here, which I'm gonna assert is an input here, is indexed off of n. The new number that we're receiving is the successor of n, so it's one larger. And we're gonna convert that into a property over the successor of n as well. And so what we're doing is every time this induction step gets called, we're making the property bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's the same thing you do with a collection or a fold or something like that. You keep combining more and more results to make the result bigger and bigger. Cool. Awesome. Laser pointer. Yeah. So the smaller result, the new number coming in, and the result is the, success, the bigger result again. It's of the successor of what it came in as. So. Hopefully that looks a little bit familiar as a right cold, but it has this extra stuff attached to it. We want the base case. The base case is just this property again, the result we're trying to get to, evaluated at zero. So again, if we're talking about the evenness of numbers, P of zero would be, is zero even? Yes, right? Hmm. And finally, we take any natural number, and we're able to compute that property for the actual, that natural number. So let me go back over this one more time really slowly and then really, really take questions if anything is strange about this. Recursion takes these, two, these three input things, roughly. It takes some property, some way of growing the property, growing the property, and some place to start the growth of the property. And then it allows us to apply that property to any natural number that we choose. And I want to say that this is a really fundamental way to use natural numbers. If I give you a natural number and you want to consume it in some way and turn it into something else, this is how you're going to do it. You might do it with a for loop or something like that, but I, I'm going to assert for all of you right now whether or not you believe me that any kind of thing that you do with a for loop off of a number, anytime n goes into a for loop, you could conceive of it as being written like this somehow, in the sense of you're taking a number and you're just slowly turning it into this property, this result that you care about. And that's the recursor. So that's probably really complicated unless you just see it as a right fold. Does anyone have questions at this point? Yes? I don't know if I really follow what you mean by growing the property. Like, give an example of how a property that grows. Yeah. Like, yeah, uh, the next slide will be a property of that, but we can talk about it a little bit more abstractly before we dive into that example. Because um, that is the most complicated thing that is on the slide right now, to be totally clear. The property could be anything. It could be, um, it could be, uh, it could be the natural number again. Like, it could be, at the simplest thing, it could be the property is, regardless of what number you come out, it's another number. And so all this fold does is just keep adding one. So we're just turning, it's like it turns into an identity function at the end. It could be evenness, but it can't really be evenness as I think you're thinking. Like if you have two and then you try and write this induction thing, you get a, e you get a proof of two is even, and then you get three, and you need to turn that into a proof of three being even, which is hopefully very difficult. Um, and so it could be evenness, but that doesn't quite work out. And if you tried to do that, you'd run into problems with this. And, those problems you run into are actually very important because you don't want to be able to write three is even. That would be something, something went wrong then. Um, you could uh, think of maybe, let's say you're gonna build a list of 10 elements. And so every element should be the number zero, for instance, but you want it to be, to, you want it to be actually m elements long. So this property could be the property of being a list of integers regardless of what we type in as a length. And what induction could do is just stick one new element on your list each time, growing it and growing it and growing it. So that's a really important thing if you want to think more programmatically. This P can really happily just ignore its argument. And if you ignore the arguments, this will it'll be much more likely to make sense as like a programming construct. So in that example, is, it, is the property, like are you a list or something? <laughs> Um, the property won't grow. It'll always just be list events. Okay. It'll be like list events, open parentheses, n. And then n means nothing at all. So you just drop the n off. It'll be list events to list events to list events to list events. And it doesn't have as much information as it could. 
which is important. Like the list events example does not use all of the information that it could have used, but maybe you don't want it to use all that information. Is that an example where it does use the information? But yes. <laughs> all right, let's move to the next one then. All right, so we're going to try and use this now. And I'm going to try and convince everyone successfully that the way that you use integers is completely wrapped up inside of this thing. So we're going to talk about evenness, which is my example. So I've got to introduce some ideas that I'm, I don't want to do very formally, but we're just going to have to talk about it. So even and odd are two properties now of naturals. So you can see that I give it an n. I give this word even an n, like 3 or 4, and it gives me a type. So I've declared that even of 3 means something. It's a type. And I have another one, odd. Odd of 3 is a type as well. So if I say odd of 3, that means something. It's an assertion of some kind. Um, odd of 3 makes more sense than even of 3. And what we're going to try and prove is that there's computational weight to odd of 3 not making more sense than even of 3. So in order to, as before, when I was talking about how I create these types and I need to introduce things, I need to tell you how to construct them. I'm going to tell you how to construct these things, but I'm not going to do it in total. I'm going to say this first one here. 0 is even. It's just a statement. And what it says is, if I hand you 0 is even, I've now shown you somehow, magically for now, magically, that 0 is even. In other words, I've given you a value of the type even of 0. And that one should exist. Like, we can all hopefully agree that 0 is even, so I can actually give you zero. this thing, 0 is even. If I gave you 0 is odd, then I hope we'd all be like, why, why, do, why do you have that thing? That thing should not exist. It's non-realistic, man. Um, so zero is even. We also have this notion. Successor even, just a name. It takes the property of n being even and turns it into the property of n plus 1 being odd, which should make sense. Like If, we ha if I give you even of 2, and you apply successor even to that, you'll now have odd of 3. And so this makes sense. I, I didn't violate any rules. And I also have successor of odd. If I give you odd of n, it'll turn it into even of n plus 1. And so the whole point of all this is to say that if I just give you these types and this base case and these growing functions, you should be able to produce all of the proofs or all of the, the values of these evens and odds things in a way that makes sense. You can't, you can't use those three things and produce even three. Or if you can, please tell me because I made a mistake. Um, but I hope you cannot produce even of three using those things. And so I'm going to just assert right now that this is the only way I can give you these types, even and odd. You have to use zero is even, suck even, and suck odd in order to create these values of even and odd. So does that kind of make sense as a property now? Is that idea there a little bit? Any questions about this? This is increasingly going off into la la land. So anything I can help to make it more concrete is totally down for that. Cool? All right. Here is the task. We want to somehow show this function, which I call decide parity takes any natural, and all the naturals are produced the way we talked about it. They're all just applied to zero a bunch of times, and turns it into either even or odd. So if you were um, stimmied reading a bunch of math terms in the paper, let me tell you this thing that I don't think um, uh, Dr. Martin Leff bothered to define. That means odd, or if that means or. Just as a symbol, that means or. So the side parity takes any number we hand it and gives us either even or odd, which intuitively should make sense. Like you should feel, you should, like I say grasp as a very intentional word. You should be able to say that, like when I hand you that concept, like if I give you a three, you should be able to tell me is that even or odd? I'm hoping that, that like I haven't confused anyone so much that that no longer makes sense because that's a pretty elementary, like even and odd. The evenness or oddness of a number is reasonable to think about, is reasonable to have access to. And the point of what I'm going to try and do here is demonstrate that this notion of reasonable to have access to, graspability, is something that we can actually write down as a programming language, which should be a little bizarre. So let's try it. Decide parity. 
takes a natural number, gives us even or odd. Decide parity of n. How do we define that? Well, we're going to use that recursor thing. With a particular choice of the induction step, the base step. Live coding, kind of. This is supposed to be n, sorry. So I'm going to pass the n that we handed, that the decide parity was given when we define it. And I'm just going to put that n right there into the recursor. So that's the n that this thing's going to be applied to. So now we have to define the induction step and the base step for decide parity. So here's the base step. Here's the induction step. Before I go to that slide, the base step is going to be, if we remember, p applied to 0. And so all we're going to do is just take p up here, which is even or odd, and stick 0 in for n. That gives us our base case. So that's all I did right there. Um, and now we need to somehow prove that that's true. We need to somehow construct a type of even, zero, or odd zero. Should be obvious which one that is. It's the left one, the even one. Zero is even. Um, and if we remember from a few slides ago, we have a way of constructing that, that thing I told you. Zero is even. And so what we're going to do is we're going to stick on the left side. That means in left, zero is even. So. Any questions about that? That's a little bit strange, perhaps. It might be really obvious. I thought it was really strange when I first saw it. Um, OK, yeah, totally. Um, we're trying to construct even 0 or odd 0. And we need to tell the computer, effectively, which one of those two things we're trying to construct. And because the even one is on the left side of the, the wedge, that's why it's in L in left. If I was going to say 0 is odd, then I would have written in R and tried to fill in something inside of it. And interestingly, I couldn't do it. There would be no way for me to do that. There's nothing I could fill. I have no way of saying odd is 0. So if I wrote in R right there, I would be stuck forever. Yes? That's a really good question. Um, the way you're thinking about it, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is that this base thing is a, a process that returns like true or false based on whether or not the input is even or odd, right? It is very similar to that. And again, like this is something when I was first learning all this stuff, it takes some time to kind of get the idea in there. But um, we're actually not, cre we're going to create a process that does that but in a really weird way. And all we're doing right now is just trying to, I have to go back to the terminology I was using. I have these notions of types, and I have these ways to construct the types. And the constructors are the only things that give meaning to those types. And so if we go back a few slides when I wrote all this stuff, this even type, I want to create a value of it, a value of even 0. And the only way I'm capable of doing that is using this e 0 as even. And so instead of creating a process which answers the question, is this even or odd, I'm actually producing evidence, which might sound kind of mystical at this point, but I'm producing evidence that 0 is even. And I've constructed everything in such a way that I cannot produce evidence that 0 is odd. There's no way for me to do it. And so in some sense, the stuff I'm writing has deeper meaning than just as a programming or program. Yeah? Um, yeah, so assertion's used a few times in the paper, and he like, talks very delicately about the definition of assertion. Um, if you got to the second lecture, to connect this to the paper to people who have made it to the second lecture, yes. Um, when I write even of 0 over there, that's a judgment of a type. Even 0 is a type. And when I hand you 0 is even, that's a judgment of that type being true, which is where I start to make this connection that these things hold like logical value and hold like actual meaning is that 
I'm able to make that judgment of even zero being true because I constructed this so that the notion of zero being even is constructible. So. So, so it's more like the concept that you're passing in true rather than zero. I'm passing in mystically Existence. existence. I'm yes. passing like yeah, it is true. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's more like if I hand you like um here's a really interesting type, integers. If we try and try and think about integers as being some kind of truth, like evenness is, what is what are the what are the proofs of integers? Well, here's a three, and what did I just prove to you? I proved that integers exist, and that's the same thing that's going on here. Even of zero, only exists, or even of n only exists if n is an even number. That's an interesting property of these types, and so if I prove to you that even of three exists then you should be really confused. I, I cheated somehow, because even if three can't exist, that doesn't mean even. But if I hand you even of zero, you're like, cool, I get that that was there. I grasp, I grasp the notion that zero is even. Yeah? I guess just to ask, the idea is that we have zero even. If we had said zero is odd, we could have inverted the entire notion because of this entire property. Um, so if we had zero is odd, if, we, if somebody gave you that, and you're like, I don't know if I trust you, you're kind of like a shady dealer here. I didn't think zero was odd. But you could still do that. You could apply successor of odd to z odd zero, and you get even of one. But if I change, if I change sure. the base case, I'm going to invert the entire situation. Um, yes, you would. And hopefully, it's, hopefully it's impossible to do so, but you right. would if you could. The base case is kind of like our origin of truth. Yeah. And then based on our successor function, we're able to yeah. I mean, I could be living in opposite planet, and actually, even means odd. And <laughs> odd means even, and yeah, and all of this stuff would still work. Like it would all function in the same way. It just at the end, when I handed this to a real person, they'd be like, "You have no idea what the definition of even and odd is, do you?" And I'd have to say, "Yes, I don't actually clearly." So. You've, there's a really fundamental point here that I skipped over in that these types make sense to us as English. And they don't have to, but it's really inconvenient if they don't, so I made it convenient for everyone. <laughs> but hopefully what I should, maybe one thing to say is if I, if I change these to like alien language and you didn't know what even an odd meant anymore, the thing that I still constructed is really interesting. It's this sequence of at successors and it keeps flipping back and forth from one thing to the other thing to the other thing to the other thing to the other thing and it starts in a certain state and it so it always starts in that same state and it flips back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and so maybe that's not called even an odd maybe that's called a flipping state machine or something but the concept of that the structure of that the feeling of it the 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 things that you cannot shift the invariance of it is all the same and it just happens to be something that we call even an odd because that's how english says this word so these are great questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, anything else? Should I keep trying to trend forward? Cool. So we're back over here. We've got this base case. And because I'm able to construct 0 is even, I can stick it in the left side. And we know that the base case starts on the left side. It's even. Now we're going to do this scary inductor thing. Remember, there's three arguments. One goes here, one goes here, and one. Then the two arguments and one result. The result goes here. So let's start with an, even, an easy one. The property applied to some n. So we, ha we were given access to either proof that n is even or proof that n is odd. I didn't make this very clear, but we should note that we don't know what n is. This n actually is not the same as that n. My notational mistake, but let me tell you that's the case. And so actually, if I hand you this type, a value of this type, you don't know which side it will be on. You can't know. Because n could be 3 or n could be 4. Or n could be 9,625. Um, so we get one of those. We get this successor of n, 6,926. Is that my example? That's a terrible example. n is, we don't know it, but n is 5. And we don't know it, but successor of n is 6, for example's purposes. And we need to prove now this property shifted up one more step. So this is all you guys asking for the non-trivial example of uh, properties. This is where that will really start to churn here. We've taken this property at a, a base case, 
and we're moving it up to the next level somehow. So is all of the stuff that just appeared there still the type declaration for in? Yes. Great. Sorry, absolutely. Okay. Yes, yes, that's it. Yeah, I, I invented all this syntax. You cannot program it into a computer. Interestingly, it's not really far away from syntax you could program into a computer if you want to learn Agda or Idris or Cock or New Pearl or whatever. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, they're really cool. You should, if you guys are interested in this, totally learn one of those languages. They're fantastic. But um, this is not a language. This is me making up stuff, and that's why it's full of mistakes. What's that? Oh, question. Yeah, maybe I missed it, but um, you use in effect the rule that P applies P or Q. Mm -hmm. Have you justified that? No. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to avoid actually talking about like lambdas in your types or anything like that. But is, is this actually work? I mean, this, can you actually execute this and produce this? Uh, oh, oh. For something? Um, I'm pretty. In which case you'd have to just. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have the fact the induction is based on the hypothesis that somebody is able to justify it, right? Maybe I can't do it yet. I can, I've only justified this one, the base case. No, but how would you? Well, oh, maybe I don't understand the question. You, you, you point out the fact that we all figured you would do, point out the fact that zero is even. Yeah. Therefore, even if zero or out of zero is, in your terms, exists. Mm -hmm. But that's saying, you know, in the general case, P implies P or Q. Mm -hmm. P being the even of, uh, of uh, zero and Q being the out of zero. So yes. If you have the left one, then you get the, the, the uh, yeah. uh, what do you call it, the disjunction. Of it. Yeah, so there, there's uh, a, a weakening principle, it, right? You have to prove it. You have to prove that that implies that. Um, I see what you're asking. How do you go from the fact that even if zero is, exists to the fact that even if zero or, we all know it from logic, but mm -hmm. in your formal system, that even if zero or out of zero exists? So that's a really awesome question. Like, I mean, it's just part of the logic. Yeah. It is, yeah. And that's it. But thinking about what those rules are is really what the paper is about. And the thing that you said, we all know it must be true is kind of ultimately what uh, Dr. Martin Lewis's justification ends up being. It's the, I did not write it, but the, the justifications of the logical, con or the meanings of the logical constants and the justifications of the logical laws. This is based off of ultimately the justifications he chooses. I'll get to it later, but it's called intuitionistic type theory, and that weakening principle is part of, like the introduction for or includes that weakening principle. You're, so you're saying some aspects of logic are assumed and of course you're not uh, assuming certain aspects of the natural numbers. So you're sort of dividing it up saying, we'll assume the logic and then we'll prove the, the, the properties of, we'll assume the properties yeah. of logic and from that we'll prove the properties of the natural numbers. So that's like, uh, that is a really key question and I am, you're completely right. I'm draping a lot of stuff behind the, the magic curtain here. Yeah, um, right. I think it's not, it would not help to talk about it right now, but maybe toward the end of the talk or after the talk, we should totally talk about did that. Did you justify it or not? No, I haven't yet. <laughs> That's the answer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I have not justified that, but because it's obvious to everyone, sort of. Okay, maybe it's not obvious, but. No, well, the point is to formalize the obvious. Yeah, yeah. We would, we would make that formalization, but I haven't. Um, so, point being, we can take that zero is even thing and turn it into zero is even or odd, which is what we're goal, what we're trying to get to, and then talk about this induction function as being handed evenness or oddness of n and having to do something with it. And so, ultimately, the last thing we got to talk about, we're almost done here, is just how do we do something with this and this to get that? Well. X, this X right here is this assertion, which means it's either evenness or oddness of N. So the way we take a look at something is a thing called case examination, um, which just means pop open the X and see what's inside. We know that, I mean, I know because I invented this language. I'm going to tell you guys that inside of an or statement, there's either a left side or a right side which is denoted as in left or in right, as I did it earlier. If it's in left, then we get this thing called even, or even of n, a proof that n is even. 
if it's in the right side, we get odd n, a proof that n is odd. If n is even, we've got this thing, then we know that if we add 1 to n, it'll end up over here. And so we need to add 1 to n. I have a laser pointer. <laughs> we need to add 1 to n using this suck even thing that I told you about before. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> and then um, stick it in the right side. So we just crossed. Boom. And if we have the right side, then this is odd. We stick it into suck odd. Again, sorry. Um, and we stick that in the left side. It goes that way. So that's our process again. It keeps crossing each time you apply the induction step. It flips over to the other side. Because every time you add 1 to a number, if it's even, it turns into an odd number. If it's odd, it turns into an even number. So that's it. That is, in a really profound but not obvious sense, a complete and strong justification for the fact that if I give you a natural number, you can tell me whether it's even or odd. If you think about the computational aspect of this, it's an algorithm for doing that. If we ignore this evenness and oddness thing and just talk about being on the left or the right side of like a, like a, if you're used to Haskell, an either statement, or um, if you just think of this as being one bit of information, is it left or right? Then we did produce that, uh, as your question said, we produced that algorithm that says, is this true? Is this even or odd? Let's call left one and right, or left true and, sorry, is this even? Let's call left true and right false. And this algorithm, if you strip out a bunch of the noise, is just an algorithm that computes that value. It is exactly the procedure for deciding that. But I did it in a really weird way, such that throughout the whole algorithm, we always are producing information in the types, which is a justification for the truth of evenness or oddness. So there's a lot there, actually. It's kind of hairy. There's a lot you could talk about with that. But I am, I'm hoping there's at least everyone's getting at least some sense of the mechanics of how this stuff is fitting together. And what I want you to remember for later is this thing called decide, and this fact that I took some natural number and I turned it into either evenness or oddness. I was able to do that. So I'll pause for questions again because um, we're going to move into a totally different format of talk right after this. I just I might make a point. I wonder yeah. if you could use your trick of like saying, you know, P or Q means you can look for P case because the Q case. I wonder if you could use some, probably some of that maybe backwards to justify your or question. P implies P or Q. Um, that's, just, that's just a suggestion. No, I, which logical axiom do you have in your system as well? Yeah. It is the logical axioms and it's also, there's this notion of verification that I'll maybe talk about a little bit later where when you're handed something, like this case analysis actually is kind of bizarre if you think about it from a very logical point of view. Like why am I able to just look at the x and know what the options that it could have been are? Like here are the two of them. Mm -hmm. What? This seems well, I don't think it's bizarre. Okay, okay. Well, but, but I could maybe try to argue it's bizarre, but like it oh, does, okay, it does, there is an interesting thing in that we can know that it's one of those two things. And that knowledge of it being one of those two things connects really closely to the question you're saying of how can we construct that weakening argument. Because there's only two ways to construct that weakening argument. You have the left side of the right side. So you can't do it the other way? You can do it the other way. They invert. So I'm saying um, I, maybe I, I don't think I understand your question. Sorry. Okay. You justify the, the uh, success or the, uh, the, what do you call it? You have the base case and then what do you call the next one? Induction. Induction, yeah. Okay, with the rule that if you have P or Q, I'll call them, then, then you either you have P and you can do something, or procedurally, then, or you have Q and you can do something, or you conclude something. Yeah. I'm saying that's sort of the reverse of, of if you have P, then you conclude P or Q. Yeah. And maybe a similar construct down, a construct very similar to that one would, would fill in the gap of justifying the, the base. And there would be a nice symmetry, too. That, that yeah, that. I'm just suggesting that concept? No. and maybe it would fill in the missing gap up there yeah. the same way you filled it down there. I can't tell you the justification for that right now yet without going into later in the paper. But what I can say is the thing that you're highlighting, this symmetry 
notion yeah. is incredibly important to Martin Love. Like that's very deeply important to what he's doing. Yeah, like, you cool. sound like you. If I say this is Genson's inversion, then you probably have heard of that before. Maybe if not, then look up Genson's inversion. That, Genson, G E N T. Yeah. Genson's inversion principle, it's talking about that natural harmony and symmetry as being very valuable. So, um, so there, you're right that we should talk about those things more, and right now I'm just not for well, the purposes I, I of. I don't have time to, I'm just saying yeah. version two. <laughs> Maybe uh, that might be a way to approach Yeah. Yeah. So, cool. Can I take this as obvious now? Everyone just totally understands this slide? Sweet. I left myself some notes. <laughs> or was it mathematics? <laughs> and hopefully I'm blurring that line for you. <laughs> Tweet it. And, and that argument, I say it like as a joke, but that I really hope that that line blurred a lot for you as we we're talking about this. Like, Ultimately, that's what the point of this paper is, that that line should be really blurry. Um, that computation and mathematics have a great deal of things in common with one another. They might even be the same thing. I don't know. Just don't leaving that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'll get there, but hopefully. There's I mean, hints of it. Oh, yeah. That, would, that could take all night long. <laughs> There's a paper at the end I'll reference. All right, so, cool. Hey, welcome to my talk. <laughs> After pair programming, we've got nice and warmed up. Woo! My talk is called Dr. Martin Luff, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying in Love Computation, because I realized that it kind of sounds like strange love and has the right number of syllables. <laughs> um, so, now we get to talk into the historical and more spacey aspect of this. So let's talk about who Dr. Per, per, per Martin Leff is, I really hope I can pronounce his name correctly. He's Swedish, and I'm half Swedish, so I should know, but I don't. Um, so he's this guy. He was born in 1942 um, and stopped teaching into, oh, sorry, this guy. That was strange love. Um, born in 1942, uh, Erdos died, retired in 2009. He's still alive. Um, Swedish Joint Chair of Mathematics at the philosophy, in Philosophy at Stockholm University. Super cool guy. Um, my background is in statistics. His background is in statistics. I'm Swedish, kind of. He's really Swedish. He's super way cooler than I am. Um, major contributions to statistics and mathematical logic. In particular, this one. Martin Luss' intuitionistic type theory. Also called intuitionistic type theory. Sometimes called type theory. Some called constructive type theory. Um, that thing is really the topic of tonight's talk. It's kind of what I was working in just a moment ago. All of the reasons, the justifications that I, I left out are based off of this thing. And from this really dense paper that I asked you guys all to read, and you all did, you're awesome. Um, it's 50 pages of him trying to say why this thing is important. The year afterward, he publishes like the manifesto. This is what Martin Luff's intuitionistic type theory is. And that manifesto goes on to influence Agda, Koch, uh, Idris, uh, higher order, yeah. now, Isabel, um, 12, New Pearl, all of these languages that are really cool that no one's ever heard of because they're actually prov uh, theorem provers. But I want to argue at some point that theorem provers are really, really, really important to how we talk about computation and computer science in the future. Um, but this is the guy, by which I mean he stood on some shoulders of some great giants. He brought together some really important things. And in particular, he's one of the first people who, um, maybe not the first people, but he did a really good job popularizing and influencing people into the notion that mathematics and logic and computation share a lot of things. They're very similar. Um, so, table of contents. Let's talk about MLTT, Martin Luff's type theory, a culminating expert, uh, effort to express and mechanize computational aspects, aspects of Brouwer's intuitionism program. Total gibberish. That will make sense later, I hope. <laughs> Um, an open system for constructing constructions. Now, you guys already got a taste of this. I just gave you these types. 
mathematicians would be super angry if I just said natural numbers, here they are. They're like, why did you give me natural numbers? Like, is that justifiable? By mathematicians, I mean really nerdy foundational mathematicians, the ones who care about stuff like that. Um, they're like, that's a, that's a question. Why do natural numbers exist? You, are you allowed to believe that they exist? Why do you believe that they exist? Um, all of those questions aside, MLTT gives you the opportunity and the reason and the structure in order to make assertions about things like that existing in a meaningful way. And that's a lot of what the paper ends up justifying toward the end. Um, intuitionistic system, which verifi favors verifiability. Hopefully we'll get a little bit of a chance to talk about this, but one of the things to keep in mind whenever you hear the word intuitionistic is, who's ever done like actual formal math? Um, raise of hands, cool. You may have run into this really wonderful thing called uh, proof by contradiction. It's like your bread and butter tool. You prove everything in graph theory with proof by contradiction. Um, and intuitionism, intuitionism and intuitionistic systems and constructive systems are mathematical systems which say that proof by uh, contradiction is kind of spooky. So for everyone else, proof by contradiction says, I want to prove that A something is not true. So I'm going to assume, ha ha ha, that A is true. And then because I have this false belief, I'm gonna prove something that you find completely absurd. I'm gonna prove a contradiction. And that means that this fake step I did before where I assumed this thing was true must have been wrong. So that's a proof now that the thing I assumed is, right, uh, is wrong. That's kind of confusing. I could write out more formalism, but actually I just want to leave you guys all confused if you're confused by that, because intuitionism says that's confusing. It's something you might not want to trust, which is going to cause some issues in mathematical history, because a lot of people do. Um, exposes the computational nature of mathematical constructions. So let me tell you that that decide parity thing is a mathematical construction of some kind. And then I also told you that it's also an algorithm. It's a really obvious algorithm for computing whether or not, like not efficiently, but computing whether or not a number is even or odd. Like those things lived together. They got smashed into the exact same object. That's bizarre. Why does that work? Well, MLTT tries to tell you why that might work. Um, and it clearly presents the relationships between types, which is, as many of you people saw those colons and started seeing like trees, thought types, theorems, which some people may have looked at the colon and thought theorem, programs, which is the bottom part, or the, the part after the equals, and proofs, which was also the part after the equals, which might not be too clear, but I'll just leave that out there for now. In particular, the relationship between those two is that types and theorems are kind of the same thing, and proofs and programs are kind of the same thing. But we'll get there. And then, as I said, it's the inspiration for all these languages, which are really cool, and you guys should pick one or all of them and try and learn it, whichever you have time for. So... Really quickly, the, some of the core components of MLTT, as I'm concerned, are the intuitionistic logic, disallowing funny tricks, computation, showing how various constructions interact and have action and motion and dynamicism, and types, which um, I like types, but actually I'm not going to talk a whole lot about types tonight. But they're really important. So what I really want to talk about is this intuitionism thing. And for that, I have to go way back in history. Um, I have to talk about... So as I said, if you ever felt like proof by contradiction is a little dodgy, maybe you haven't. I actually hadn't until I started reading about this stuff. I thought it was totally fine because my math teachers told me it was totally fine. I was not thinking that hard about it. <laughs> Got my grades. Um, that guy, this guy, scary picture. Um, <laughs> yeah, Brower. He really, really, really did not like proof by contradiction. In fact, he invented the motion of intuitionism as a statement that math should be cleaner. It should not use these dodgy tricks. It should come out of, well, we'll get into what he actually meant, but he was worried about proof by contradiction. Um, and so he invented a new kind of logical foundations to fight these concerns. The years are kind of important. I don't know if you're like me. I can't remember the years that anything happened, so I'm going to emphasize this. This is all like really early 19th century stuff. Everything happened in the early 19th century. It was like the time to be alive. Um, Brouwer believed, and this is philosophy now, which I'm not very good at, I'm not a philosopher, so I'm gonna try, that mathematics is a mental construction. Now, Plato, another guy you may have heard of, believed that mathematics existed over there. It was in some real world 
that was more real than our world and all we could do was like pierce the veil and see pieces of it and pull them back and like somehow like the things that we were finding had this ultimate truth to them because they reflected this real world behind the veil. Brower thinks that's dumb. Brower says that math comes out of your brain as you conceive of mathematical objects like evenness and oddness. There are patterns in your brain that are, let's not get into why they are what they are, but they are. Um, and mathematics is purely the point of creating those patterns in your brain. And we all just get really happy because we have these patterns in our brain. Um, then mathematical communication is a mechanism by which I take the pattern in my brain, translate it into something, hand it to you, and you read it, and you are forced. Your brain just turns into those patterns. The communication has this force of effort that causes those patterns in your brain to happen as well. Also known as convinces you. Um, he gets really mystical about this. Um, it's fun to read about. I have some links at the end if you want to. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is awesome. But I'm not going to talk about that because I really want to talk about much more specifically what's going on. So one of the things, um, if you're a mathematician of any kind, here are some names. Poincare, Borel, Lebesgue, Lebesgue Whale, Kronecker. Um, I, from my statistical background, studied measure theory a bit. Borel and Lebesgue are like really big in measure theory. And if you have a statistical background too, like think about them as I'm talking about all this stuff because the like topological and um, measure theoretic stuff that they're worrying about is what Brower called pre-intuitionism. Like they were on the right track, they just had not gone far enough because that was Brower's job. And here's the fun part. So the, 19th, uh, the early 20th century was this wonderful time for mathematical logic. People like Russell and Whitehead and Frugge and um, Hilbert and there's an endless list of people, I will not name them all, were trying really hard to show that logic was the true way of saying mathematics. It is somehow beyond all and lives underneath everything and everything that is true about mathematics should just arise naturally out of logic if you do it right. And they were trying really hard to, to do it right. They were figuring out what right would mean. Brower thought that was dumb. <laughs> it's a repeating pattern. Um, he thought that math comes out of your brain, not out of like um, this magical special place where logic lives. And it feels like the things that the formalists were trying to do were trying to force too much structure on mathematics and they were gonna get in trouble because of that. And then we'll talk about what happened. Point is, um, Hilbert is really big. He's super famous. Brower is Hilbert's student. Brower and Hilbert get into fights because they don't agree with one another very much. All right, so what is intuition number two? One of the most important and hackle-raising things that Bauer did was eliminate the notion of the law of excluded middle, which reads like this. We have a proposition, which is like that evenness or oddness thing. It could be the sky is blue. It could be that one plus one equals two. It like think of some kind of mathematical statement like that, and those are typically propositions. Something you could assert as being true or false. And that's exactly what all the formalists thought, that propositions were true or false, period. That makes sense, right? Like, here is the number three. It is either even or odd. What else is there? Do you have a question? We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Do they deny them? Or is it, is they got really the sad. <laughs> they got really sad. Yeah. yeah, we'll get there. You killed a lot of people. Paradox is really blew a lot of people away. Yeah. <laughs> The fun one is self-reference. That, that, that killed everybody. Um, turning a blind eye to that for now. Three is either true or, or even or odd. Done. That's all there is. It's true or false. By which I mean it is either even or not even. Which is like I said, we did that before. Like three is either even or not even. We prove that that's the case. It is either even or not even. Um, and that was what they believed because it makes a lot of sense in like very natural like day by day propositions. Like it is either sunny outside or not by some definition of sunny. It's not right now. Um, and they believe that and they built everything on top of it. And we'll see in a little bit that literally the way that logic works in the formalist notion, at least as, as far as I understand it, which may be false, um, cannot live without that thing. And Robert was like, nah, that doesn't make any sense, guys. <laughs> and he has, a, he has an interesting argument. So if you believe that things are either true or false, and I want you to kind of turn over in your head what Brower believed, it's Mathematics is always a mental activity. 
And so the proposition, really large number, which I'm not gonna bother trying to name, is prime. Is that true or false right now for me? I'm, I can say yes, it is true or false perhaps. Maybe I can say that. But I certainly don't know if I, picked a, if I just wrote a gigantic number on the board whether it's prime or not. I would have to sit down with a computer and prove it somehow. And that was what Brouwer was really interested in, the fact that I have to do work to get to that true or falseness. And to not get into too much detail, people in all points in mathematics are always worried about infinity. And the real problem is Brouwer was like, you guys talk about infinity all the time, and infinity is really big. And so if you have to do work to get into infinity, you might be in trouble, guys. <laughs> My paraphrasing. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, so why we don't automatically believe. Oh, this is kind of interesting. It might be mind-bending. I don't know. We don't automatically believe P or not P, but we instead believe it is not not the case that P or not P, by which I mean it is irrefutable that P or not P is true. I'm not going to go out there and prove that it's one of it's something else. I just not have I have not yet proven that it is one of those things. I'm in this fuzzy state before proof, and I want to really care about that fuzzy state. Um, so if you remember his mentor, this guy, he's kind of scary looking too. Really awesome though. Hilbert's great. That hat's awesome. Hilbert is awesome. Like I I'm going to make Hilbert look bad in this presentation, but he is the man. He's really cool. Um, yeah, you can read it. He didn't like this very much. Um, him and Brower got into lots of fights. Uh, so the, the very short history here was Brower was a little student, and he had these ideas about intuitionism, and he published a couple papers, including this really, like, you know how when you're like a, a freshman in college, and you're maybe like a, a writing SEMS major, or a writing major, and you write like really bad poetry until you get better at it? Brower wrote like the equivalent of really bad mathematical poetry about intuitionism right as he was a young student. And it actually has a lot of really good ideas in it, but it's very like edgy and not together and not something you can really easily present. And then he started talking to Hilbert and he realized that he can't keep saying this stuff because Hilbert doesn't believe it at all and Hilbert's really famous and if he just like barrels down and does some really good math for a while and becomes Hilbert's student, which is what happened, then he can become much more prominent. And so he just shut up about intuition for, intuitionism for a while and did some really wonderful things about fixed points. If you ever heard of the Harry Ball theorem, which is like the most hilariously named mathematical theorem. <laughs> um, it, that, that's Brouwer, Brouwer's Harry Ball theorem. Um, no, it's about how dynamical systems work in particular topologies and it's really cool and extremely influential. And he wrote these things under the tutelage of Hilbert, or actually, I, I guess he wrote those to attract Hilbert's attention and Hilbert was like, man, you need to become my student and they became good friends. And then he turned around and said, hey, Hilbert, intuitionism. And Hilbert was like, what? Taking the principle of excluded middle from the mathematician is the same as prohibiting the boxer the use of his fists. What do I do with my, all of my math was based off of that. You can't just take that from me, um, says Hilbert. And why did he care so much? Because Hilbert, like all these other logicians and mathematicians at the early 20th century, were interested in this idea they called the Hilbert's program, or formalist logic program. And the idea was, um, I guess maybe the next slide. The idea was that logic is really clean and cool. Prior to these guys, mathematicians just sort of made stuff up and talked to each other. And then when they all kind of agreed with one another, like, cool, that's math. We all sort of agree, <laughs> um, which is probably still kind of the case. But uh, it, around the 20th century, people got really worried about that because they did not believe things anymore. And um, Hilbert was part of this whole thing. So let me step back a little bit to Russell and Whitehead. Have you guys ever heard of the Principia Mathematica? I think that's how you're supposed to say it. Um, it's the 600, no, it's 300 page long, extremely dense proof that one plus one equals two. Literally, that's really what it is. There's more to it, but that's really what it is. Um, <laughs> someone say not much more to it? Yes, if you believe piano arithmetic. Oh, is that it? They don't believe anything. Oh, that's without piano arithmetic. That's below, that's, that, I think pages below, three, one, one through 386 are like creation of piano arithmetic, and then like 387 is like, oh, and one plus one equals two. <laughs> <laughs> cool, guys. Sure. They, what they wanted to do is they wanted to, to like, so, Frugga was doing this too. All of these people were like, 
you guys are starting mathematics way up here with some notion about numbers and things. And I don't really know what those are. Like, we all agree intuitionistically, maybe? No, that's not the right use of that term, sorry. Um, we all agree that numbers kind of make sense, but I don't know why you got there. And Russell was like a super depressed guy when he was at Cambridge because I think he like nearly got kicked out because he kept fighting with his professor. He's like, I know what you said. What you said made sense, but I don't believe where you started. You have to start from something more fundamental, so I trust you. And nobody did that. And so Russell met Frege, and Frege was trying to do it in German. He wrote this really cool thing called the Begriffsschrift, I think. I don't pronounce German. It's like this really bizarre graphical notation for writing proofs. And like no one had thought to really do that before, and so it was really bizarre and cool. And if I have some time to talk about Frege more later, I can do that, because he's cool. Um, and Bertrand Russell and Alfred Whitehead were colleagues, and they wrote the Principia Mathematica, and they tried to start from like zero and build all the way up to one plus one equals two. Because if they could do that, then they could show that logic really was the foundation. You don't always have to start, you don't always have to write 500 pages to get to your math. But if you start somewhere with math, and then I write 500 pages that proves that where you started was wrong, you gotta stop. You gotta go start over and recreate your foundations, because I just proved that they don't make sense from logic, and logic is pure and true and ineffable. Like, ineffable. It is correct. That was what they were trying to do. Um, and so people got really excited about this. Maybe not at first, because I think um, when he first published this book, he took it to the publisher, and the publisher was like, yeah, 400 pages to say 1 plus 1 equals 2? I am not paying for that. And so Russell and Whitehead actually, I think, um, funded the first publication of the Principia for a while until people started getting really excited about it later. Yeah, the original Kickstarter. Shit, well. <laughs> <laughs> Self-starters. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that, that's what they were doing. Um, struggled to find the ultimate logical foundations. So what I was saying. Um, overcame problems. So this is where some self-reference starts coming in. Russell's really famous for creating this set called imaginatively R. R is the set of all sets which do not contain themselves. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But if you think about it for a while, it doesn't make any sense. And that's a problem, because that was exactly what he was worried about. The foundation of mathematics did not say that you can't say R. And he's like, you can't say R. If you say R, something's wrong. But you can't tell me I can't, so there's something missing about mathematics. And so um, yeah, that was actually halfway through writing Principia Mathematica, or maybe before that, and then he wrote the Principia Mathematica to introduce a mechanism called the ramified hierarchy of types, which allowed you to pre prevent R from happening. And then he was like, cool, math is done. We did it. R isn't there anymore, it works. No one understands it, but it works. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. In other words, a triumph, 400 pages. That's all it took. Nearly destitute Russell and Whitehead publishing their 400 page 1 plus 1 plus equals 2 proof. Um, cool. Hilbert is a very famous mathematician around this time. He's really excited about this, and he's very famous for, like, I, I, he was the leader of like the Royal Mathematician Society, some kind of probably British thing. I wish I knew the details of that, sorry. Um, and he gave this really famous speech toward the end of his career where he was saying, these are the 25 problems of mathematics. They will shape the future of mathematics from now on, or from now for the next 100 years. And two of those problems were directly related to how can we use the stuff that Russell and Whitehead and Prega invented and somehow make all of mathematics just automatic? Like, if logic is there, can we find a way to create an algorithm? Not that they, I don't think, said the word algorithm yet. But can we find a way to just turn that crank on logic for a while and get and just spit out mathematical truths? Is that possible? Can we find an efficient way of using logic to verify the value? Like, is this mathematical statement true? No, it's false, because logic said so. And I ran this algorithm until it did. He was really excited about this. And so Hilbert's program was to somehow just staple down all of mathematics by logic. We can just do it, guys. I'm really excited. We must know. We will know. That is on his gravestone. Now, he was really good at that in general. We'll find out shortly that those may have been a little bit premature. But um, <laughs> he, like, he, was, he was a very influential leader, and he led mathematics in the direction of the 20th century. Great guy. And these were some major things that he was super concerned about. And so that, that's, that's what I want to get in your mind. Like, that was what the 20th century was. Logic. Guys, we're going to do it. We're going to solve math. Let's, let's get math, all of it. Let's just knock it out. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what formal logic means, how it works. Now, I am not a logician. So this is how Joseph Abrahamson thinks formal logic works. 
It might be slightly wrong, but I hope that I'm at least going to get close enough to the right essence that it gives something interesting. So, formal logic says we have a language called logic, which allows us to write down statements called propositions. There are only so many ways to write down statements, so we can go ahead and enumerate all of them here for. Number one is the most basic statement. Number four is the fourth least basic statement, I guess. We can write down all of them. And then we're going to talk about, oh, first, by, by, by statement I mean just like, the moon is made out of blue cheese, it is light outside right now. They're just phrases about the world. They're not necessarily true. And that's really what the heart of the problem is. How can we prove that they're true? So what I'm going to talk about here is what's called entailment. So we line up all the propositions. We have all infinity of them and line up them all on this side so we have this really big matrix. And we say, how do they relate to one another? The relationship I'm in particular interested in is if one causes another one to be true. So this is what you've seen before when you're like A and A goes to B. Uh, I messed up my notation anyway. Entails B, modus ponens, right? Like if A then Q, or if P then Q is true, and if P is true, then Q is true. You combine those rules, they smash together, and they form entailment of the result. Maybe I'm not saying that right, sorry. So you take those things, and you start to apply them to this matrix. So here's one. This is called reflexivity. It says, if P, oh, laser pointer. If P1 is true, then P1 is true. Now what the point of this exercise is that we have to design the rules so that they make sense. We want to put all of the right, we want this, this process is eventually going to churn out all of the answers of mathematics guys, so we have to design these rules really carefully. But this one seems pretty obvious. If P, then P. If P2, then P2. That, that's, that's a pretty obvious rule. Hopefully that doesn't bother anyone. Then there's some other rules, which I'm not actually going to go into, but the point is that we always have this notion that we take something over here, we go and read out. Oh yeah, P1 causes P2. If P1, then P2, by some rule. Um, there are a number of them. I'm not going to talk about them. We also might prove if P1, then not, is red, P3, by some other rule. So that's what we do. We design our logic so that these rules exist. This entailment relationship exists. Then we pick one and we call it axiomatic. We say P2 is true. It's like this is not like natural numbers exist. This is like something really fundamental. We can all agree that P2 is true. This is an axiom that we're going to build into the system. And we turn the machine. OK, P2 is true. So that means P2 is true. Cool. P2 is true. So that means P4 is true. OK, cool. Let's, uh, let's mark those down. Now we can turn it another crank. P4 is true. OK, cool. So that means P4 is true. All right, we're done. Those are all the truths, those two, P2 and P4. OK, maybe we need some more axioms. P1 is true too. Okay, um, now P1 is true and P3 is false. Okay, cool, let's turn the crank. What happens when those are true? All right, P3 is false. That means um, nothing, because this is, this, that's not how the square works. Well, P3 is false, so nothing applies there. And we're done. P1, P2, P3, and P4, or P1, P2, and P4 are true. P3 is false. And we had to assume some rules to see that, and we had to, axiomatize P1 and P2. Super fast and loose, but what I want to kind of emphasize here is this idea that we write down all of, all of the possible statements, we design some careful entailment relationships such that the relationships hold together in the right way, and then we stick some axioms into the machine and turn the crank, and that's roughly what happens, we turn the crank. Now Hilbert was concerned because this matrix is four by four, but the real matrix is infinity by infinity, and so if you pick some statement you're interested in, it might not be obvious how to turn the crank to get down to your statement. But like in principle, it's all there. Logic's done. Cool. So I just, I just made it bigger now. We have, um, we have 16 statements now plus dots, which means infinity statements. Here are the ones that are, so I'm going to pay really fast in this with this. There's a notion of logically true and actually true, which is really hard, and if we want to talk about this later, it's cool, we can talk about it, but for now I just want to sweep that all super under the rug. Actually true is the notion of like, two really is even, guys, right? <laughs> Logically true is, I have a system of rules that enable me to eventually show that if two is true. And what we really want is that all of the things that we believe to be true, like even is 
two, or two is even is churned out by our logical machine. And so the boxes indicate things that are really true. Um, here's reflexivity again. Here's some rules. Here's some more rules. Here's an axiom. Here's the algorithm running. That took me a really long time to draw, guys. <laughs> Didn't realize I was going to go through it so quickly. Anyway, point is that this algorithm will run based on the entailment relationship and the logical design, and all of the truths will pop out. And formalism, guys, it's cool. Here's how math happens. And you know, that's, that is how math happens. We do that today. Most of the time when you're using mathematics, you roughly are turning the crank on a machine like this. Um, now the trick is that, like I said, if you want to go find some infinity long statement down at the bottom down there, then you need to be clever about the way that you turn the rules so that you can pull it out. And that's why mathematicians have jobs, because being clever is hard. Um, but some mathematicians have jobs. Um, but uh, that, that's logic. That's formalism. So <laughs> that's a sudden statement. <laughs> Despite all the optimism, we can know, we will know. It's actually completely doomed. Um, a lot of people prove this. Some people that are really famous are Church and Turing. You've heard of Turing machines. You may have heard of Lambda Calculus. Those were actually designed as instruments in order to answer one of Hilbert's questions about that whole thing. And they said, no, Hilbert, it doesn't. It's not as cool as you thought it was, sorry. Basically, they showed that there are things that are inconsistent in the system, that no matter how you design those rules, if you try to enumerate them all like that, you will find things. So one of the things that can't happen in that rule system is A is true and A is false. That's, that's a problem. We've not learned anything if A is true and A is false in a really dramatic way. So they showed that not that there was inconsistency yet, but that there were certain things that we just could not figure out. There was no way to figure out which one, if whether it was true or false. In particular, if you guys know, like, infinite loops, <laughs> that, that's a pretty familiar one. Those, those end up in logic somewhere, and you don't like them very much, because it takes a very long time to show that they're anything. Um, and in Church's case, you've heard of the Y Combinator. Like, that's what Y Combinator is. Church invented something very similar to it in order to demonstrate that lambda calculus, which was a model of logic, doesn't behave the way you really hope it does because it has infinite loops. We like infinite loops now. They did not. Um, yeah, that one. Basically, Church said, I want to talk about the logical statement. Will this program stop? And then he realized he can't say that. He cannot answer the question. He cannot know. So we will know. We must know. Church is like, ah, oh, shucks. <laughs> we can't. Um, and then Girdle really screwed things up. He showed that we tried to list out all the truths possible. And then he showed through a really ridiculous, clever mechanism that no matter how hard we try, we're always either in one of two situations. Either one, um, we are inconsistent. We are proving A and not A, which blows up everything. Or two, there is some, you know how I talked about real truth versus logical truth? There's some real truth that we really care about that is not con that you did not reach. You could not do it. And if you want to study that, there's this really crazy book called the uh, Girdle Escher Bach, The Eternal Golden Braid. <laughs> Some people have read it, I see. Um, it's, I, it's a you should read it. It talks a lot about this in a very poetic way. Um, you can also read the Wikipedia entry. We may or may not be putting everything in reading group on that. Oh, yeah? Since I have the microphone here, there may or may not be a reading group on that book in the future. Um, so that book is somewhat about this. Um, actually, Hofstadter, the guy who wrote it, super excited about these self-reference loops. He thinks they're like the origins of consciousness. Um, I don't know if I am going to talk anything about that, but there's a lot of excitement about what Girdle and Church did. Hilbert, however, was not excited because it meant that his program was dead. He was wrong. That sucked. I mean, like, Fraga was already screwed because Russell's paradox, his whole set is not a set thing. Like, that broke all of Fraga's work because he tried to do this too. And then Hilbert tried to do it using, like, Russell and Whitehead's better logic, and then it worked, turned out that didn't work. And so the 19, the Early 20th century was a lot of optimism, and then like around the 30s got really pessimistic. Um, cool. So all of that to say, how can we escape from the ruins of formal logic? That's what Brouwer's all about. And that's what we did earlier today. Like, tricked you. You guys were doing something really foundational and crazy when we proved that n was either even or odd. Because if we write that differently, that is law of excluded middle. Wait, oh man, I did not talk about, oh no, it's decidability, that's what I'm supposed to say. Um, this property right here is decidable, we know, we have evidence that we can actually figure out whether or not that is true or false, because we did it, we did it right there, it's an algorithm that will go and get it. We have some system that allows us to find those things. 
Um, and what Brouwer did, which is really interesting, and hopefully this will be this is clear after all this pontification I've done, is he uh, basically what intuition says, it's intuitionism says, and allows it to dodge all of the headaches of Hilbert's programming, um, Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica. Is he just said, um, it, I don't believe that we can answer all questions. They're not all decidable. Maybe some are. Evenness is decidable. We showed that. Um, but not all things are decidable. And as soon as you just relax a little bit there, you don't have to worry about all of these girdle things as much. Like, you kind of do. They're important, but you don't really have to worry about it because you never said that what girdle proved was wrong was right. So you're like, yeah, I knew that already. Thanks, girdle. Um, so that's what intuitionism is. It just relaxes and says not all properties are decidable. Actually, we have to write algorithms which demonstrate it. And those algorithms have to have created some kind of constructive way to find out whether it's true or false. You can't just tell me P is true or not true. You have to give me some mechanism to figure out if it's the left side or the right side. You have to do that. That's how intuitionism works. You must do that. If you don't, then I don't believe you. Um, which is what I just said. An algorithm, yes. And this is why I want to like this is where I'm starting to get back around to the point after that long diatribe of hopefully entertaining history. Um, Brouwer was all about, he didn't know it yet, but he was all about construction. And construction is a very different thing from proof. Proof says, if we just name all of the properties of this system and then turn the crank, like we have already constructed logic. We just have to go find it. Brouwer turned that on its head and said, no, no. Um, in order to prove anything, you have to expel the effort to get to that proof. You have to do the work. You have to make that pattern of things appear in my brain, which is effort and work and difficulty. And if we work through mathematics in that way, everything looks a little bit different. But it still basically contains the stuff you care about. It's just a little bit more formal, you formal mathematicians. Um, so cool. Brouwer's intuitionism posits that mathematics must be conceived of and realized, which is all I've been saying. And one of the things that we're going to swoop right back up to Martin Luther again. One of the things that he started really popularizing, I don't, he was not necessarily the first person to realize it, but he was super into it and talked about it all the time, was programs are constructions. Program, algorithm, those things are mechanism of construction. That is what it means. And so programs are a suitable way to realize things in logic. The types of programs are the propositions that we want to prove. N is even or odd. That is a proposition and a type. The program itself, the fact that we were able to write it is a proof. And so this gets back to like the algorithm versus the type thing. If I tried to write a thing that was false, like for instance, um, for all natural numbers, that natural number is even, I could try all day long forever and I would not be able to construct a program that gives you that property because it's false, which is how we get this connection. False things cannot be constructed. True things can be constructed. Things that may be true or may be false, we don't know yet, just haven't been constructed yet. If you succeed in constructing them, then oh, well, cool, it's true. That's really informative. You just did mathematics. And Brouwer would celebrate that a whole lot. Um, and things that have not yet been constructed, such as things that people literally don't know. Like we can write down a proposition that describe something in mathematics that currently no one has a clue about. Hilbert would have said that that thing is true or false. We don't know which one it is yet, but it is true or false. It is. Brouwer says, show me the proof. Construct it for me. And to do that, why don't you build a program? And so that's when we get to the whole point of this paper, the whole point of Martin Luff's, like late stages of his career was trying to Marry intuition concept construction to programming. The two things are the same. You can use programming languages that are carefully designed via these rules that I'm not talking about, but they're there. They're in, they're in lecture three, by the way. If you get all the way down to lecture three, there's a weak form of them. It's not the final form, but they're pretty good. And if you read my blog post, it's basically me just mocking that, that lecture three and writing out in different languages. Um, provides a toolbox for adding new realizations in a standard way. This is really cool too, and I haven't got a really great time talking about this, but I want to give a little bit of emphasis about what this means. 
Gödel said that if you create a logic, something you care about isn't in that logic. Always, you're done. It's always not there, you know, as long as it's sufficiently gone. Anyway, it's always not there. Um, so Brouwer was fine with that. If you read Brouwer's actual philosophy, he did not believe mathematics was ever done. He believed that you always had to add new constructions. You couldn't just say natural numbers exist and nega numbers don't exist. You just have to admit that maybe later in life, you're going to construct nega numbers and they're going to have to exist in your theory now and you just keep building. And so Brouwer was like, math just keeps building. And so when Gödel says, oh, there's something you care about that's not in your math yet, Brouwer's like, I know. And if I really care about it, I will construct a way of talking about it. I will create the proper language to conceive of it. And then I'll start talking about it, because that's what mathematics is, growing. Duh, Gödel. <laughs> um, oops. And so this is what Martin Luff is doing. He's explaining how you can create a language that allows you to prove things using construction. And he's also talking about what is required in order to add new things to that language, like trees and natural numbers. I just did that earlier today, and I was basically following his rules. And those make sense and hold together in some natural way. And that's what he did. He, he just was justifying what those natural ways that things hold together are, which includes this Genson's inversion thing, for instance. Um, and so yeah. On the meanings of the logical constants and the justifications of the logical laws, intuitionistically. This is what logic means. And this is how you use the laws to continue to create new things. This is why we're justified in continuing to grow our mathematics. And this is why we're allowed to program. This is why we're allowed to continue growing programs. That's what he's doing in that paper. It's not obvious because he talks about talking. He starts talking about Greek linguistics, but um, he's building a programming language for intuitionistic logic, and he's giving giving you the tools to do it too. And so, the year after he publishes that paper, he, like I said, publishes a manuscript documenting the very basics of a powerful dependently typed language, which allows you to do all the stuff that we did at the very beginning of this talk, and allows you to construct new things and execute Brouwer's intuitionism in intuitionistic type theory. And then that goes on to inspire all of these proven theorem provers that uh, people use today and inspires languages like Haskell and Rust and Scala and Swift and all of these ones that are putting like functional programming into everything. Like a lot of that comes from this. I'm not going to say that it's, they all directly came from this, but they're all coming from the same source. And this uh, Martin Luff guy is pretty good at talking about it if you can manage to get past the first couple paragraphs. <laughs> so um, three pages of references and I'm done. Thanks everyone for listening. I got 15 seconds. <laughs> okay. He has, he, has a list of, he, has a, he has a list of statements that he says are true. Mm -hmm. This is not in your list. Diagonalization. Is this in his list or not? It's true, but it's not in his list. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't true, then it is. If it isn't true, then, then it ought to be. It's a false thing in his list. Mm -hmm. It must be true. Yeah. So that proves there's something missing. Yep. That, that, that's. The, the, the argument that's made right there is called diagonalization. Cantor invented it, and it shows up all over these places, and that's exactly the stuff that right. killed the everyone. The use of this, yeah. and the use of this is a, a theorem from recursion. Yeah. Well, right. Self-reference loops. Well, I'm going to jump in right here yep. and say bum, bum, that bum. we are welcome here. It's around 845. Uh, we can stay and chat. There's some beer left. I think there's some pizza left. Please consume all of this so that we don't have to clean it up. Uh, We'll probably stick around until 9, and then uh, generally what we do is we'll bounce maybe to like beer works or something to go uh, hang out if we want to continue the conversation. Uh, but what I'd really like right now is for everyone to give Joe a round of applause. Awesome. All right, so thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you all for asking questions and being an awesome audience, too. So This was one of the most interactive papers that I've ever been to, and I've been to some, like, quite a few at this point. Um, cool. So Thanks, everyone.
Vale.